I want to invite you to take your Bible and join me this morning in the most popular Christmas passage, Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 20. And uh, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to try to take a very familiar passage and look at it expositionally, but also look at it in a slightly different way. And so here's what we're going to do. First of all, I have divided the text into six movements, or if you like, six acts. And what I have done is I have identified each section with a popular Christmas song that I think appropriately corresponds to those particular verses. So, for example, uh, our first uh, movement, our first act, will be verses 1 through 5, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Jesus came to the right place. And then our second movement will be in verses 6 and 7, away in a manger. Jesus came at the right time, and we'll work our way through the six movements or acts of the passage in that particular way. As we walk through the verses together, we will also highlight both the rightness and the goodness of what God did in time and space and history when the Son of God invaded planet Earth. We want to remind ourselves again this morning that what we will be reading and walking through is not a fable, it's not a fairy tale, it's not a myth. These things actually happened in space and in time. And then finally, at the end of each act, I will take one stanza from that particular song and simply read it with you that I think captures very well those particular verses. So again, very well-known passage, but we'll look at it in a slightly different way and pray that God will honor our efforts this morning. So act uh, one, verses one through five, O little town of Bethlehem, Jesus came to the right place in those days a decree went out from caesar augustus that all the world should be registered this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of syria and all went to be registered each to his own town and joseph also went up from galilee from the town of nazareth to judea to the city of david which is called bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of david third time to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Luke is the only gospel writer who connects the narrative of our Lord's coming to specific dates in world history. He begins right there in verse 1 by noting that it was in the days when Caesar Augustus reigned as the emperor. Uh, This, of course, is the one who was formerly known as Octavius, but in uh, 27 B.C., the Roman Senate gave him the designation Augustus or the August One. Uh, He would reign from 27 B.C. to 14 A.D., over 40 years, and many would say he is, without question, the greatest of the Roman emperors. Uh, He expanded the empire. He brought the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, to the empire and ushered in a golden age of literature and architecture during that particular time. We also note from this verse that there was a census that had been sent out across the Roman Empire. A census usually served two purposes. One, it was for registration in lieu of military service, but also more popularly, as we know, it was for the purpose of taxation. Uh, Jews were actually exempt from military service, but they certainly were not exempt from taxation. And isn't it amazing what God did? God used the decree of a pagan emperor to fulfill the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Matthew's gospel very specifically attaches the coming of Christ to that particular prophecy. Then it says in verse 2 that this was the first registration, I would take note of that, when Quirinius was governor of Syria. It is possible there is not uh, hard and fast data, but it is certainly possible that Quirinius served twice in this office, perhaps from 6 to 4 B.C. uh, when our Lord was born, and then again in A.D. 6 through 9, actually uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 37 refers to that second uh, 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 registration and that second census under Quirinius. It also says in verse 3 that they went to Uh, be registered each to his own 
town. Uh, this refers to the ancestral origin of a family, and we learn both from Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel that both uh, Joseph and also Mary were of the house or the lineage of David. And so he has a uh, right to the throne both through his mother but also through his father. And, of course, this is a fulfillment of the promise that God made to David with the wonderful Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 17. And so the Bible says that they went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David. It, of course, was also the birthplace of David, this being the city of Bethlehem. And how appropriate it is that our Lord would be born in a town where literally the meaning of that designation is the house of bread. Uh, the one who is the bread of life indeed came from the house of bread. Bethlehem is a small town. It's grown in recent years, but during the time of Jesus, it was a very small town, very insignificant, uh, approximately six miles outside of Jerusalem in the Judean hill country. It's a very old city and has a very rich biblical history. For example, Rachel was buried there, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 19. Elimelech and his wife Naomi lived in Bethlehem before going to Moab. And of course, we know that Naomi came back later with Ruth, who according to Matthew chapter 1 is one of the great, great, great grandmothers of our Lord Jesus Christ. David, of course, was raised and anointed as king in Bethlehem. And as we noted a moment ago, Micah gave a prophecy in his book, chapter 5 and verse 2, that the Messiah would come from there. And now we see this being fulfilled in the birth of our Savior. Uh, as a point of interest following that, Constantine uh, built a church over the alleged site of Jesus' birth. Those of you that have ever had the opportunity of going to Israel have certainly had the joy of going to Bethlehem. And there is a church right there that allegedly uh, is where our Lord was born. In fact, uh, one of the first times I went, I took uh, my small sons with me, and there's a star down there in the cave, and it's rather interesting to see what people will do uh, to that star. Uh, they will kiss it. Uh, they will rub their face upon it. Uh, they will roll over on it. And as we were standing there, my son Jonathan looked at me and said, Daddy, can I go and kiss the star? And I said, no, you may not. You cannot kiss the star. I cannot even begin to fathom how many germs are located in that particular place. Nevertheless, there is good tradition that that was the vicinity, certainly, where Jesus was born. And also right alongside of that is the cave where the church father, Jerome, translated the Bible into the Latin Vulgate. So there's a lot of rich history about this city called Bethlehem. The Bible also tells us there that this was in the area of Judea. This, of course, follows the name of the patriarch Judah. So reference to the southern empire, Israel known, of course, in the north, Judea known in the south. And verse 5 also informs us that as Joseph went back to his city of origin to be registered for the taxation, he also took with him Mary, whom the Bible describes as his betrothed, who also, it says, was with a child. Of course, betrothal is more than an engagement. It is less than a full marriage. Legally, they were married. But yet the marriage to this point had not been consummated. And so they go together and she goes pregnant because we know from Matthew's account as well as Luke's account that that which was in her womb had been conceived by the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of what was read a moment ago, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And so she is at the time of her delivery going to a very insignificant place, a very insignificant town. One man said the location of the birth was a humble one. The place of the birth would be a humiliating one. And so when we think about Bethlehem, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. 
little town of Bethlehem, Jesus came to the right place. Number two, away in a manger. Jesus came at the right time. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the cataluma. It is translated the end, but it could be translated the lodging. We'll make a reference to that in just a moment. Luke in verse 7 describes the nature of the birth of our Lord, and he notes that he was Mary's firstborn. Uh, contrary to Roman Catholic theology, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46 makes it very clear that she had other children subsequent to the birth of our Savior. The Bible also says of her firstborn, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. They were simply strips of cloth that were used to help bind a baby's body. Uh, on the one hand, it kept a child warm, and in addition, it would be used to keep them from injuring themselves with their fingernails, uh, clawing at their face, and uh, perhaps even poking their fingers in their eyes. It was also believed by the ancients that uh, wrapping them with these linen cloths would strengthen their limbs and help them to grow up healthy. It's actually still done today in some Eastern cultures. It says that he was born in a manger, nothing less than a feeding trough for animals. Now, there is, of course, the notion that Christ was born in a stable, though nowhere in the Bible does it say that. There's an ancient tradition that says that he was perhaps born in a cave, which was used as a shelter for the animals. But again, no actual description is ever given in the Bible. What we are told, though, at the end of verse 7 is there was no place for them in the inn. But what we need to note is that word inn is the Greek word kataluma. It literally or simply means a lodging. Now, it can refer to an inn. But it can also refer to a guest room in a private home. Furthermore, animal stalls with their majors were normally located inside the one-room residence of peasant families. Yes, it is also true that they were kept in caves as well. And so an early Christ Christian tradition places the location of our Lord's birth in that cave. The fact of the matter is, we cannot know for sure where our Lord was born, but we can know for sure in verses 8 through 12 why our Lord was born. And so away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay, the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. He came at the right time. Movement number three, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Jesus came for the right reason, verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Luke now moves from the birth of our Lord to its proclamation. This, by the way, is the third eyewitness account that you have in the Gospel of Luke. Prior to this, there was an appearance of angels to Zacharias, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And, of course, there was an appearance of an angel to Mary in chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Luke notes that Jesus comes for the right reason because he comes, as the text tells us in verse 11, as Savior, as Christ, and as Lord. And isn't it interesting that God chose to appear to a group of shepherds who were out in the field watching their flock by night? Uh, the shepherd fields, by the way, you can still see to this day there outside of Bethlehem, about two miles located outside the city proper. Some have uh, 
uh, uh, postulated and speculated that these flocks were possibly for temple sacrifices, though again, uh, we cannot be sure. Furthermore, we really can't be certain as well of the month or the date or the precise time of our Lord's birth. This is just something that we can speculate about, but something that we cannot be certain about. But I do want to make one, I think, important observation at this point. Most of my life, I was taught that the Lord appeared to the shepherds because he wanted to appear to those that were despised, those that were unclean, uh, those that were thought very little of in the culture of that day. But the fact of the matter is, when you study the Bible, shepherds almost always appear in a very positive, in a very uh, different kind of light. And so I do think that the focus is upon their humility, I do think the focus is upon their lowliness in terms of status, but the idea that they are despised or unclean, I think, is clearly foreign to the thrust of Scripture. What we should understand is this. They were unimportant and ignored by the world, but they are not unimportant and ignored by God. You see, the shepherds are just everyday people like you and me, and they are especially the object of God's redeeming love. You see, God is indeed concerned about those, as Matthew tells us in chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, who are poor in spirit, for as verse 3 reminds us, it is theirs that will be the kingdom of God. He then says in verse 10 to the shepherds as the angels appeared to them, do not, they were filled with fear, verse 9, and now they are in, challenged and informed, fear not, for we bring to you good news of great joy. John Wycliffe in his translation of verse 10 said it this way, I evangelize to you a great joy joy. So there's an interesting contrast, isn't there? They are to exchange their great fear in one verse for great joy in the other. And why is it that they are to exchange their fear for joy? Verse 11 tells us, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, which of course again is another reference to Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That simple phrase is very profound in terms of one's Christology. First of all, he is described as the Savior. He is the Deliverer. And interestingly, in the Old Testament, the word Savior is almost always used as a reference for God. Do I think there is an implicit declaration of deity here? I certainly think so. Not only is he the Savior, he is the Christ. Uh, He is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies that begin in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 where the Bible says, I will send the seed of the woman, perhaps an implied reference to the virgin birth. Oh, you will bruise his heel, but he by his work will crush your head. And of course, the idea of the Messiah is especially related to King David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and also the wonderful messianic psalm, Psalm 2. John Wesley, in reflecting upon these titles, wrote a wonderful song entitled, Hail, Thou Long-Expected Jesus. Here are just the two stanzas of it. Hail, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our sins and fears release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the saints thou art, long desired of every nation, joy of every waiting heart. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. He is the Savior. He is the Christ. He is also the Lord. Interestingly, That term kurios or Lord was ascribed to the Roman emperor, but it was designated to that particular individual by men. The one that was born this night in Bethlehem is designated as Lord, not by men, 
but is designated so by God. And so a sign is provided to the shepherds as they will come and observe the birth of this king. He will be wrapped in swaddling clothes and he will be lying in an animal feeding trough. He will be lying in a manger. One man said it this way, the Messiah's crib is a place where animals eat and drool. No child born that day had less hopeful prospects nor a more dismal future. Yet deity has invaded planet Earth, not as a prince, but as a pauper. And my friend Daryl Bach points out very well, Messiah's life will contain an unusual bookend for a king since he was born in an animal room and he will die with robbers. And so the song, O come, O come, Emmanuel, O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrel cease, fill all the world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, Jesus came for the right reason. Number four, hark the herald, angels sing. Jesus came with the right choir. In a sense, God speaks for the first time in 400 years, and he puts on glorious, visible display his glory. Verses 11 and 12 have given us the account, the account of his coming to the shepherds. Now in verse 13, we see what they say. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's interesting to note that angels praise God at the creation Job 38, verse 7. They also praise God at the incarnation, Luke 2, verses 13 and 14. And they also rejoice at the salvation of sinners, Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. The word host there stands for a, a military, is a military term which stands for a large band of soldiers. And now they are praising the highest one in the highest way, offering their praise to the one who has come to save us. And what do they sing? Glory to God in the highest. They are ascribing the highest possible praise to the one who has sent a savior to save us from our sins. He is, of course, as we just read, the Savior, Christ the Lord. And as we just read, he has come for all people. But yet the text is very clear. Though he has come for all people, all people will not benefit from his coming, but only those who receive him by faith as personal Lord and personal Savior. In this particular passage, the Bible speaks to them as men with whom he is well pleased. And so God indeed has come to women like Anna. He has come to men like Simeon. He has not necessarily come to men like Augustus or men like Herod or men like Pilate. And yet in Jesus, heaven and earth, angels and humanity come together rejoicing in the great gift of our God. So we sing my favorite Christmas song, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Jesus came with the right choir. Movement number five, go tell it on the mountain. Jesus came to the right persons, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. 
And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And then moved to verse 20, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Uh, the announcement by the angels to the shepherds moved them to action. Again, Daryl Bach says they set off nothing less than an evangelistic chain reaction. And they indeed obeyed immediately. And the text says they came with haste. They moved quickly and they moved in obedience to this thing which the Lord has made known to us. And so they came to Bethlehem. Uh, they came to the place where the baby was. And what did they see? Well, the text is very clear. They saw his mother, Mary. They saw his stepfather, Joseph, and they saw the baby just as they'd been told, the little Lord Jesus lying in a manger. Verse 20 then tells us something wonderful about the shepherds. They now, now keep this in mind, they now take on the assignment of the angels. In other words, they became the first evangelist, or what I like to refer to as the Christian evangelist, the Christmas evangelist, and they begin to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 20 tells us they returned glorifying, praising God for all they had heard, all they had seen, all that had been told to them. And going back to verse 18, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And so again, my mind goes to one of our favorite Christmas hymns, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Go Tell It on the Mountain over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born, and God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. So, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. He came indeed to the right persons. But movement number six, and perhaps the most tender of all, Mary, did you know? Jesus came through the right woman. Verse 19, very simple, very direct, very short. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. As Reformation Christians, as Protestants, uh, we do not worship Mary but we certainly should honor Mary. We should not throw out the theological baby with the theological bathwater because of an excess that we find in certain traditions because she certainly is the most noble woman who's ever been born. She's certainly the most prized woman to ever walk upon the earth. Think about it. She is the only human being, as far as we know, who is with the Lord Jesus from the day he was born to the day that he ascended back into heaven. And so re reflecting upon and meditating upon and thinking about what has occurred with the birth of her baby boy and the coming of the shepherds, the text says Mary kept, Mary treasured, Mary pondered all of these things in her heart. She went over these things that she had seen and what she had heard again and again and again. The idea is there is ongoing contemplation and ongoing uh, reflection. And indeed, as I mentioned a moment ago, she is the only human being who will be with the Lord Jesus from the beginning of his life to the end of his earthly life. A.T. Robertson, the great Greek scholar, said it this way, Did Mary also keep a baby book? May Luke not have had opportunity to see it. In other words, he did not have the opportunity to investigate or interview the angels, but he certainly could have interviewed the shepherds. I have no doubt that he interviewed Mary. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb and the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. It is again one of our favorite Christmas hymns uh, written uh, and uh, published by Isaac Watts. 
And yet, interestingly, the hymn was not written for his first coming. The hymn was written for his second coming. And if you pay close attention to the words, it's very easy to recognize that is indeed the case. I speak of the hymn, Joy to the World, The Lord is Come. And so I close our study this morning and we prepare to take up our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, reflecting again upon the gift that came many years ago, but the gift that also will soon come again. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. Verse 4, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love, the wonders of his love, the wonders, the wonders of his love. Indeed, there is joy for the world, a joy that we must take, a joy we must share, and a joy we must see go to every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. That's what Southern Baptists are about when they take up their Lottie Moon Christmas offering. That's what Southern Baptists are about in our efforts to get the gospel around the globe. And so I'm going to invite those who will be taking up our offering this morning to make their way down here at the front. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to take our offering, and we're going to sing and rejoice over the one that came to save us from our sins, Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these very, very familiar verses. I fear that we can read them over and over again to such an extent that we are no longer uh, put in awe of what exactly took place 2,000 years ago when you sent Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the one that is indeed the Lord. And how we thank you that in amazing grace and goodness, he came down to us for we certainly could not have arisen to him. And how we thank you that in your divine providence and your sovereign wisdom, he did not come so much as a king, but as a very simple man, a very simple baby, born into a situation that, Lord, seemed all but helpless. That is, again, Lord, a reminder of where your heart is. You care for the disenfranchised. You care for the hurting. You care for those that the world ignores. And how we praise you that you don't do that like the world does because many of us in this room would acknowledge uh, we come from very humble roots. Uh, There's no reason that anyone should pay attention to us. And yet in your great grace, you did. And you saved us. But Lord, you not save us simply to take us to heaven. You saved us that we might indeed take the good news to those who've never heard. And Lord, one of the ways we do that is by praying and interceding for the nations. Another way we do that is by our giving. That others might indeed go and tell those who've never heard the glorious good news of King Jesus. So Lord, there is indeed joy for the world. Joy to the world because of Jesus. May we, Lord, be quick to experience that joy, but, Lord, may we also be quick to share that joy that we know ourselves. All for your glory, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.